Passion Harvest. <laughs> Hello, passionate listeners. Welcome to Passion Harvest, where we aim to inspire you to live a passionate life. I'm Louisa, your host, International Passion Ambassador host of your show. And if you like this episode, please do subscribe. I'm very, very excited to have an exciting guest on the show today. His name's Rory Duff. And um, if you haven't already heard of him, he's pretty amazing. He actually said to me, um, if you want to find out a bit more about me, look at my website. And I didn't tell Rory that I've already stalked your whole website. I'm one of your number one fans. So let me tell you about Rory. Rory Duff is one of the leading pioneers in the world in understanding of ley lines and earth energies and how their frequencies can be highly beneficial as well as dangerous. Rory researches geobiology, the study of how the earth affects life. Rory came up with the first ever classification of earth energies, which is now used by thousands of people around the world. And he was the first to fully map all the major energy lines that could be found over an area of 200 square kilometers, something that took him an hour a day for six years. That's amazing dedication. Rory was also the first person to rediscover the most powerful lines in the world, the emperor dragons. There are only six pairs and one pair runs across the USA. In his talks, he explains how and why these particular lines come and go over centuries and the effects that this has on mankind. It was these studies that led Rory to finding the link with the Knights Templar and the most sacred locations. In addition to that, he is the first person to ever to offer a viable scientific hypothesis as to what these energies are and how they are generated within the earth and how this links with the universal consciousness. This is explained in an easy to understand uh, understand manner in his seminars. Following up on synchronicities, Roy Duff came across some practically unknown template chapels with some exceptionally strange symbols that had never before been deciphered. This led him to producing his highly successful documentary, Holy Grail Found, and the popular books Grail Found and Grail Bound. The latter resulted on following up on further synchronicity about a common link running through some of the most significant prophecies in the world. His mission in life now is to stay on his vocational path. He says that this seems at the moment to be leading him to raise awareness of the main energy lines and to help get people gathering at the key sacred sites all around the country four times a year. These are the harmony times when all the earth energies move at the same frequency. Roy now considers this that group prayer and meditation on these harmony times is intimately linked with the rise of the divine feminine and coming rebalancing. Rory now senses that this is perhaps the one and only thing left for humanity in order to overcome the problems in this world, which when succeeded will allow us to usher into a new golden age, just as many of the prophecies predict. This is his story and this is his passion. Rory Duff, welcome to Passion Harvest. Hi, thank you very much for having me on. So joyful and excited and passionate to have you on the show. Um, I normally ask a background, but I've got so much I'd love to cover for you and those people who don't necessarily know about ley lines and grid lines and earth energy lines. I'd love you to um, explain a little bit of that before we dig deep into everything that I can't wait to cover. Well, I can perhaps tell you a little bit how I discovered them. Uh, and, and, and how that, that came mm-hmm. about. I was a geologist on the mines in Africa, and we used to get farmers ringing up the uh, geology offices, asking us to go out and look for water on their, on their lands. So an Italian geologist took me out for the first time, and we, well, I was quite surprised he brought out his dowsing rods <laughs> from the back of his car. And he said, oh, we know the water's here, Rory, we just need to be more accurate. And uh, the, the water runs in small channels. And if you're going to drill it, you can miss it by a meter unless you're very active. And we used to douse for these channels, you know, 30, 40 meters down, and then drill them and hit water every single time. And the dowsing, that feedback of hitting water was an important aspect of understanding what, what of course, the curiosity as a scientist, well, how, how on earth is this happening? What, what's going on? And that stayed with me when I came back to the UK and uh, I came across uh, the work of a chap called Hamish Miller, who was uh, writing about a very large uh, alignment running across the UK, which was called the St. Michael alignment. But there's a pair of earth energy lines, the St. Michael and St. Mary lines that 
to run up this alignment. And I, I was living not far from that. So I thought, well, if it's dowsing water, dowsing earth energies, I'll look at that. And I came across them and found them. And in instantly I was thinking, well, what are these? And at the time I was doing Aikido and learning about uh, human chi energy. Mm. And so here was an earth chi energy. And I was thinking, so what was the connection? And I began to look at it from the point of view of maybe it's some kind of uh, concentration of gravity because it seemed to move towards the areas of relative high ground. But that didn't seem to sort of work. And then I, I read a lot of research on people talking about this being connected to electromagnetic, electromagnetic activity. But the lines we were looking at weren't really responding all the time to, to, the, to the same uh, measurement equipment. So you, you couldn't always pick up the same results. So it didn't seem like there was a direct effect on electromagnetism. So we're left kind of wondering what else it might be. And it wasn't for some time that I'd begun to, when I moved to Wiltshire, and I was starting to douse some interesting sites that I'd come across with, for instance, the ch chapels on top of hills. Mm -hmm. And I, I found an energy line running close to my house. And so I started dowsing that uh, to find out what it was. And I found that every morning when I took the dog out, the line kind of like moved a little bit, it wasn't quite in the same place. So I, I conducted my first experiments just measuring where the line was every day and I set it against the datum. And that proceeded into looking at where the line was every hour. And as soon as I started looking at where the line edge was every hour, I began to realize it slowly tracked one way and then back the other way. And How interesting. At this, this time it took was something like six hours to go one way and then six hours to go the other way and i thought well why has this never been seen before because there are dowsers all over the place and then i twigged that uh, actually where everybody goes to dows are the sacred sites like like Avery and glastonbury and this is where these intersections of sand lines occur but they don't move at that point it's like it's like the two points of a guitar that, that hold the, 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 the string is at one end and the other end, uh, that's fixed. But the, the, the string in the middle, that vibrates. And it's the same thing with the line, where the nodes were fixed, the lines in the middle had this backwards and forward movement. So- Can I just clarify was, the nodes is where the energy points meet? That's where the, the lines cross the line, over each other. The lines cross right. over. And, and uh, the more powerful sacred sites, the more powerful lines cross over at them. And looking at these, these energy lines, I've found that you, you couldn't, most people just did all their studying around the sacred sites. I mean, that was the interesting mm -hmm. place to look. The big cathedrals but, and... Yeah, yeah. So, uh, it, and, and they didn't see the side, side movement. That's not where it exists. So you had to sort of be in the middle of nowhere to be able to see that the, there's a frequency to these things. And, and this is a frequency which is down in the microhertz, which then made me think, well, I, had, I, me I measured the... the that these frequencies for months and months and months but i measured uh, 12 lines for 18 months to see uh what the frequencies were doing and i noticed there were different groups of lines that had different frequencies and that after a while all of these lines moved together in the same frequency it's like they all went to one side and they all went to the other side at exactly the same point and so how did you was, measure the frequency because of the time it takes to go from one side to the other and back again, that's a cycle. And, and, and at one hertz is one vibration in a second. So two hertz is like two vibrations in a second. Mm. But if you take a second, and, and these, these lines are taking like six hours. In fact, the, the biggest lines in the world take 24 hours to go one way and 24 hours to go the other way. This is around about six microhertz. It's like so small that this, it goes so slowly. Measuring equipment, I mean, the, the, the best measuring equipment that geologists use uh, uh, could, can't get down to that level of frequency. Um, they can get down to about two and a half thousand microhertz, and it takes weeks to be able to pick these vibrations up. And we've, we've known that vibrations are throughout, throughout the earth, because sound is just the audible part of a vibration. And um, what, what the, the next question was, if these were vibrations, what was making them? And why were and, they and moving? Why were they so important? And, and why was it that, that these intersections, when you, when you start mapping an area, and, and, and I was coming home from work every, every day for, for six months, and, for six years, sorry, and uh, it was just easy for me to take a detour on the way home and just continue my mapping project because 
You know, that's, that's what I call passion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolute but, but passion. It, it was just curiosity, you know, just thinking, what's going on? And so I needed to find out what good looked like and what was on the ground. So I began building up this map and learning about what these different lines were like. And, and it was very clear the intersections, the major intersections, were on ancient sacred sites and modern sacred sites. So they were in places where there were dolmens, where there were set stone circles, but they were also in churches. And then you, you found them sometimes, they were in graveyards, if not in churches, but and then sometimes, you, either way, you, you built this picture up and, and there was still this, what, what's going on? And what, why, why churches? Why? Why, for instance, would a line take a detour to go through a children's playground? Why would they, I've seen them take 45 degree detours to go through hospices? So you're saying um, the people that built the cathedrals didn't have a knowledge of the lines, that the lines actually gravitated towards the cathedrals or the they, significant points? Yeah, but the, a lot of these churches and cathedrals uh, like, uh, were built on ancient sacred sites on top of them. And you find that sacred sites have been sacred for for many, many, many generations. I mean, there's, there's a place down in, in, in um, France, Mont Secours, where, where the Cathars were, were, were uh, all um, unfortunately wiped out. Um, but this is a, a, on a place called the Pog, which is a, a mountain sticking right up. And, and we know that, that it was a holy shrine in Roman times. We know that before that, it was a holy uh, Celtic place. And, and, and then the Cathars found it very, very holy. So why would three different groups, and maybe more, find that a particular location in the world was where they needed to go and pray and meditate. And those different religions from the different groups would always come back to these same special locations. It was as though there are places in this world that were more sacred than others. So what was causing that? And, uh, and why, why would a line move to go to a, a particular place like a playground or a hospice and, and likewise why would lines stay away from some places mm. or veer away and and uh, i hope you're going to answer the questions for me because i'm fascinated yeah. well this this is where we take trips down into science and, and i met again through some amazing synchronicity uh, a, a gentleman called ron pearson and, and ron had, and an most amazing engineering physicist I mean, he, he invented the gas wave turbine um uh, he was a university lecturer in uh, thermodynamics and fluid mechanics it's, it's, it, he was a genius and um i was very fortunate to to meet him and live near him and we used to walk our boxer dogs together he spent 24 years in his retirement researching a new theory for the creation of the universe because he looked at the big bang theory and it was just filled with flaws which only an engineer could see i mean he, he applied what he calls conceptual logic and 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 he pointed out the flaws to, in the big bang theory to professor davis and and, and also to, to alan guff and, and they were so embarrassed they couldn't even reply and it has gone on to there's this whole myth of this whole universe it's starting with a massive explosion is it's a giant myth which has been pushed on mankind and, and uh make, were made to accept this and uh, it's absolutely wrong and so he came up with a new theory of, 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 of how creation could start the problem was <laughs> he didn't expect this but the 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 nature of the initial uh things he called primaries and the way they interacted led to this form of basic computation occurring at a sub-quantum level and that led to a form of consciousness that could direct the waves of energy at the sub-quantum level to create spikes of energy that creates the illusions of particles on the quantum world which is slightly larger and, and he, he could explain how matter could arise through these interacting waves of sound vibrations yeah. or vibrations on the subquantum level, but he had this unfortunate side effect of explaining how intelligence behind the universe could arise. And, and so the scientists were having a real struggle, not least because they didn't like the fact that uh, he, he, well, yeah, he, he'd, he'd suddenly come up with a, an explanation for all forms of psychic phenomena, including evidence for universal consciousness. And, 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 and so from that point, you begin to see that universal consciousness and vibration are intimately connected. So when you've got these deep-seated vibrations, which, which we, we worked out with, with these energy lines, and, so, and I'll come to how that forms in a minute, 
sound and, and consciousness are, are intimately connected at this sub-quantum level so that uh, ourselves with our fragment of mind here connects with the universal mind if you like it does so far more easily at certain places where there are sound concentrations that link it or have potential links to this universal consciousness and, and, and this is where people when they get into the right meditative state in these places they have these uplifting sort of uh, uh, feelings of enlightenment which was like you, you're you're connecting to consciousness itself and then all sorts of extra things would happen which i think the templars discovered with manifestation with healing and uh, uh, and communication with the uh, with the other beings that exist and um this is another thing which ron's theory explains so nicely is that uh, he talks about the ability of the subquantum the universal being able to create different frequencies of matter on the quantum world that all sit within the same area but on different frequencies mm. so these are habitats these are environments that fragments of mind can live on so that he explained exactly where the mind goes when our physical body dies and he, he, he then immersed himself in looking at all this sort of stuff he was a scientist he, he never had any interest in psychic phenomena but soon he started finding uh people would knock on his door and says i've got a message from you from people like isaac newton and all that and, and he realized that he was the one who had this explanation for, for all this experience that people and observations people are having of, of, of survival after death and, and where our ancestors live and this now fits so many of the the, the stories we hear around the world of, of, uh, of, of, of uh, in fact 2000 years ago it's commonly accepted that survival after death was was, was commonplace but ron's now put this huge theory together <laughs> explains it bit from, from from the science it's all done the mathematics and everything has been peer reviewed in various variety of, uh, of, of, um, of, of of scientific papers but he has one problem it was, didn't intend it but he realized that you could this whole thing didn't need to use relativity well, now relativity is, is like sacrosanct if you're a theoretical physicist you know, you've got to have that to get your funding if you don't use relativity you don't get the funding and, and, and his theory didn't require relativity mm. it could be all explained through the mathematics in, 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 in his uh, initial theory and he came up with a theory I mean, i'm really going off, off topic but it's no 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 it's fascinating and, and also what i'm understanding from what you're saying as well we often think when I mean, this is the traditional heaven, you go far away in the sky, but what you're actually saying is that it's right here. It's just different levels or layers or vibrational yeah, frequencies you, of consciousness. It's all here. Yeah, but if you see, if you think about the fact we see just a small spectrum of light, and yet we have all, all, all other light, which we can't see is still in around us. We hear within a small spectrum of sound, but we feel within a small spectrum of feeling. Of, I mean, we, we look at our bodies around us and we think, or a table or a chair, we make the mistake of thinking it's solid. There's nothing solid in it at all. It's just particles. And the particles are just, if you look into the particles, there's just energy. There's no solid dot in the middle. It's energy. Mm. And what he's saying is this energy has come up from the subquantum. So we're, we're tuning into a particular matter frequency. And yet our minds can tune into other matter frequencies within the same area and everything's available them. to us yeah yeah so it, it, it it's it's at these sacred sites that our minds seem to be able to, to to make these connections far more easily if we enter into certain certain meditative states so, so my sound, question to you though is do you think that they were built uh the sacred sites obviously, obviously they've been around for centuries were they built subconsciously that the human body or the mind or the soul or whatever you want to call it connected with those high energetic frequency points or some people have the belief that they were they were built there to control the power i mean there's many many theories well one of the things that we're discovering is that the universe seems to work cyclically and things move in grand cycles over thousands of years and there's there are people like rudolf steiner who have, have, have researched consciousness and have have seen that the mind has moved and consciousness moves over time 
from group consciousness to individual consciousness to group consciousness. And when we're in a sort of group consciousness, it's not like a hive mind. It's just that there are, we're so much more interconnected with things like empathy and telepathy and sensitivity to what we're thinking and feeling. It was probably not even necessary for our ancestors 20,000 years ago to not even have to talk. You know, if you talk about the origins of language, it possibly came out of the fact that we had to need to talk because we were losing a form of group consciousness. And in this group consciousness, you would have been so much more sensitive to where these energies were. You could probably see them. And we kind of lost that uh, over the years. And we went into this sort of period of, uh, of the rise of the ego and, and, and where clairvoyance and these natural abilities began to fade. And then we're now moving back into a form of group consciousness again. And that's where, where, where what I've seen this seems to be connected to the amount of cosmic energy we get because cosmic energy is linked to these energy lines as well, which I'll come to a little bit later. So when you ask about where this all began, I think this is this sound and consciousness existed well before humans. And, and I think that when humans came along, we're looking at being they, at some point in, in, in group consciousness when there's a high cosmic environment. This was something they would gravitate towards because they would see the benefit of certain areas because they could communicate with their ancestors more easily. They could, could communicate with all the beings. And, and, and um, that's, that's, I think, where the sacred sites were, were, were probably thought of as being places to, to congregate around and live with and, and, and gather around. I think that's what they used to do. They would, they would migrate on great pilgrimages. We hear of, of the Celts going on great pilgrimages in the past to, to sacred sites. and. Uh, even the, the Hopi Indians and, and, and back then they would go on great pilgrimages to places specifically to go to certain sacred sites. So sound and consciousness are connected and they're linked to these, these sacred sites. But the mechanism that we needed still was well, well, why? How does a site become so sacred? What's driving the energy to get there? And, and what are these movements of these side to side movements of these energy lines all about? And uh, one of the things about these side to side movements, which was strange, is that the lines could be two different angles, right? But they would, you would think they would all go the same way when they moved. Yeah. But they don't, they all go backwards and forwards like this. So you think, well, what on earth is happening with this backwards and forwards movement? And it took quite a while to realize that these were expansion and contractions. And I can't go take a, a a step back a bit and, and think about what we're using with microphones at the moment. We're taking uh, sound waves and the microphone has something in it called a transducer, which, which takes sound energy and transduces it to electrical energy. And, and at the other end, the electrical energy is transduced back into sound energy. So transducers convert one form of energy to another. And one of the best transducers is, is iron and nickel. And Iron and nickel is found in the center and the inner core of the earth, in a huge inner core. And, and at, just outside the inner core is the, the molten, if you like, the liquid outer core. Now, when you put energy into a transducer, like the inner core, it will convert it to another form of energy. So if you've got a large amount of energy, maybe from the earth's electromagnetity, going into the inner core, it will produce sound. And what that, or vibrations, and what I mean by that, it's an expansion and contraction of the inner core. So just like an earthquake happens, the, the earth actually rings like a bell, it vibrates, and the vibration of an earthquake expands and contracts the earth ever so slightly. But those are the vibrations that we pick up on seismographs. But on, on the inner core, on a very, very slow process, there'll be an expansion and a contraction. That will send out spherical waves of sound all the way out to the surface and we'll bounce off all the different the, the layers on the way. But when you start looking, well, what kind of patterns will that make on the surface? And sound, as you probably were, is a mixture of high pressure and low, uh, and low pressure. They're waves and, and the high pressure waves on the surface of a sphere, when you start looking at that, are all linear. And, you, and, and they're lines of high pressure with low pressure in the middle. So it's a, what you get with spherical standing waves of sound from the center of the earth are these linear concentrations of energy that go right around the earth. And that is connected to the linear concentrations of sound lines, I think what we were finding. And you see them crisscrossing all over each other as well. And, and um, 
This now explains why you can get uh, lines like this expanding outwards and back. What's actually happening is if you can imagine a balloon and, and you draw a black triangle on the balloon, okay, and you blow the balloon up, you find all three sides of the triangle will expand as you blow the balloon up and they'll contract as the balloon, as the balloon comes down. So that it, it can, inner core can do this within the liquid outer core. It can expand and contract. So what we're, feet, what we're getting on the surface is this small expansion and contraction of these, these frequencies. Now, the really interesting thing which, which, which swung it for me was that well, we have different frequencies of lines and they, they're groupings. I call them the type five, type four, type three, type two, type one lines. They have different frequencies. And what iron is, is an incredibly good mechanical filter. And I'll give you an example about different frequencies. We'll have 16 hour frequencies, 24 hour frequencies, 36 hour frequencies, 48 hour frequencies. There are none at 32 hours. There are none at 21 hours. There are none at 17, 18 hours. There are clear gaps between these frequencies. And that's exactly what a mechanical filter does. When, when, when iron takes, gives out sound like that, it will have gaps. It filters out so there's no frequencies in certain ranges. So it's behaving exactly like you would expect uh, uh, to produce these different groups of, of frequencies. And, and they found, they call eigen modes, and, and they're peaks where you find lots of frequencies. That, and that the geologists in, 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 in Antarctica using uh, super cool gravimeters, they're trying to pick up something called the mysterious hum, uh, which is a sort of low vibration from the Earth. And, and they're getting down about two and a half to 3,000 microhertz. And at that point, they're picking up these same eigen modes where there's groupings of frequencies and then a gap, another grouping frequency and a gap. And these groupings of frequencies they're picking up match the higher octaves. Well, they are the higher octaves of the fundamental frequencies that, the, that, that I think are coming out of the, of the inner core as it's behaving as a transducer. Now it's only a hypothesis, so there's still things to be tested, but it explains now the different frequencies of lines that come from the inner core. Very um, interesting. And I, I look, I guess I have to ask a very simple, very simple basic question. Why are these energy lines around the, why, what, what, what are they doing there? Okay, we're getting into deep stuff now. Oh, I was trying to be simple. <laughs> okay. The, the motivation behind life ha has to start with the motivation that you would think the universal consciousness itself has to have. If this sort of giant supercomputer started, what is it doing? Why is it created all these different environments on the, on the quantum level, the different habitats for mind? Why have they done that? Why has it done that? If it's not to, to understand more about its environment. And, and what Ron and I used to discuss was that, that it thought that, that, that trillions of years ahead, it could foresee its own demise. So it was motivated to try and explore and find out why its environment would, uh, would end up eventually disappearing into what Ron called a giant liquid state where there was no impossible information to be traveling. And, and so it was creating a way to grow and learn. And, and if you start looking, well, what is the purpose of life? Mm. Uh, and and, and for, for me, how I try to answer that, well, what is common to all life? And the one thing that's common to everything in life is that life grows. Everything living grows. So if you start, well, how, how do you grow? And you're left with physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Okay, so you've got, that one driving force is behind the, the universal consciousness. It's created these habitats for us to, 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 for fragments of its mind, if you like, to experience, to grow, to learn. And this is exactly why we as individuals have this thing inside us where we want to grow and learn and develop. That, that is our true purpose in life, to learn and grow and develop so that we can move on to the next stage and, and uh, um, not have to relive this life again, if you like. So, so we, we, the, the, the driving force behind this all uh, and why we have these energy lines where they are, is this, this, this is a, a grand design, if you like, that's been put in place for us to experience. And the fact that we have our particular 
type of time, our linear time in this existence and our, and our, our rise and fall of the ego of, from group consciousness to individual consciousness to group consciousness. Well, all the different other worlds have got different forms of environments. And, 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 a, and a wonderful book by Jane Roberts called Seth Speaks. Seth Fabulous is book. I, know, I was yeah. about to say, I know, you're a, I know you're a Seth fan, so am I. Well, well he talks about various camouflage systems. And, and Ron and I were introduced to, to, to Seth at the same time by a French medium who contacted us. And, and it was like shining in our faces is exactly what Ron's, uh, his science was explaining exactly what Seth was explaining about his different camouflage systems and, and, and how they were providing different learning experiences for the mind to, to grow and develop. And so um, our, our role here is to let, grow and develop just as the universal mind is to grow and develop. So we've got a sort of skeletal structure of vibration which holds this whole thing together. And that's kind of like what, what these energies do. It, it's, uh, and, and, and Tesla would say is uh, everything stems from vibration. And, 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 and you have people in, in religious backgrounds saying, you know, that, that, this, that everything was spun into existence with song. And you have, in the beginning was the word, the vibration. It, it, there's, everything is down to sound. And even in Goethe's fairy tale, there's this wonderful uh, conversation between the gold king and the green snake. And they're talking, and it seems totally out of place in, 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 in this fairy tale that you should talk about. But they're, they're saying, what is uh, more, more divine than, than light? And it's, it's, it's uh, sound. The sound is, is the most important, and then light, and then matter. And if you think about uh, sonoluminescence, where you, you can actually push sound waves together and create flashes of light. Sound creates light, and light goes on in the quantum world to create the illusion of matter. So you have that existence. The sound and vibrations is the foundation of everything, and it's 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 these these energy lines, if you like, they are, they're going through all the worlds of existence, and that's how we can connect to them. In fact, what what the uh, some of the, the, the religious groups have said in the past is that at these intersections, they call them the axis mundi, and this is where the tree of lives grow. And this is our growing consciousness that can reach through to these other worlds, which are, are represented as spheres on the Kabbalah and on the, in the Sephiroth and the other trees of life that you find in, in religions all around the world. There are trees of life that, that, that you find. Even in Brazil, the Siva tree is, is, is regarded as a tree of life. And this is our, representing our growing consciousness that can occur on these axis mundi to, to connect with these other worlds. Um, Really going off topic from energy. No, 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 I, I love it. But even if we're not standing on the particular very high energetic points, I feel that the, the constant cyclic movement of the lines in some way are providing us an ability to access a higher consciousness and also offering us energy in some capacity. It is. But we, 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 again, we, we, if we're not careful, we... we, we confuse ourselves with our words. These are, these are linear concentrations of high pressure within the field. So just if we're not on the lines, we're in the same field. Yes. So we can connect everywhere. It's just that the concentrations are much more powerful. And you also mentioned the, the, the cosmic energy. You said it directly relates as above, so below. What, do you mind just discussing that briefly? Because I've got so many exciting things to discuss yeah. with you. Well, Having realized that the source of the energy, you needed a constant source of energy to, to explain why the, the energy lines were always there. And of course they rotate with the earth. So it had to come from the center of the earth, but it didn't explain the type four and the type five lines. The type four lines had 24 hour frequencies and the type five lines had 48 hour frequencies and, and something extra was needed and, um, to provide the source of energy for this. And something quite shocking happened in the summer of 2017. We discovered that all the energy lines started getting wider. Mm. And they got wider from the central band inside them. And at that stage, we began to recognize there was a, a, the sun was in some way providing energy through to the core of the earth. And that was actually expand, uh, ex causing the energy lines. So that was an extra source of energy. And at that point in December 2017, we found that a new emperor dragon suddenly came and, and, and uh, another pair of uh, these huge type five lines. So we had three type five lines, three pairs 
at, the, at the 2012 when we went to Spain for the first time because we found that they, they, the two of them there were, weren't crossing over in a node and that, that comes to repairing and working with it. But having new ones that suddenly came onto the earth, they thought, well, what on earth's going on? Why have we suddenly yeah. got these returning emperor dragons? And that led us to recognizing that the mechanism at work here that led from the sun's energy coming to, to, to the earth and, the, and now the active galactic nuclei, the cosmic energies were also increasing. The magnetic fields of the earth and the magnetic field of the sun is coming down and the, the solar system is exiting something called the local interstellar cloud. The, the Voyager and the IVEX uh, probes that are sent outside the, the solar system into the outside the heliosphere were picking up uh, magnetic particles and over the period of time they, they were realizing that actually there's less there now than there was. They were incredibly surprised to find there was a magnetic system outside of the heliosphere anyway but what, what the scientists are now saying, we're actually moving away from something called the local interstellar cloud. And that means we're, we've got three magnetic fields now, which are lowering. Now, magnetic fields really shield us from cosmic energy. Now, cosmic energy is life-changing. We know that it can mutate cells and, and, and there's boosts of, of cosmic energy in the past, which are linked to evolutionary trends. Um, so an increase in cosmic energy will cause evolution on, on the Earth. And uh, what we're finding is that more cosmic energy was getting through. But when it hits our atmosphere, it splits into gamma rays and neutrinos. Now neutrinos are high energy particles that can go straight through the Earth. And when they hit the inner core, they're slightly diffracted. And when they're slightly diffracted, you can actually, the energy is imparted to, to the inner core. Mm -hmm. Now we know this because of places like Ice Cube, it's an observation station in Antarctica. They have these huge holes in the ice and they, 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 they have them to pick up neutrinos. And when they pick up neutrinos, they, they, they see them passing through the earth and they, they, they call it acoustic tomography. And, and it builds up a picture of the interior of the earth by the way they pick up these deflected the neutrinos. So, but we know that happens, but what hasn't been put two and two but equally four before is that that imparting energy from the neutrinos going to the transducer is now a constant supply of energy which is suddenly switched on because the cosmic energies can come through these magnetic fields. So it's like having, have, having a big cloudy sky and there's three suns in it and we're getting the sunlight from three suns and suddenly the clouds have gone away and now six suns have come. So we've got more light coming from these active galactic nuclei more energy, more is reaching the inner core, and suddenly we're projecting more energy lines on the surface, which could come up with these massive, em massive emperor dragons. Is that a is that a negative thing? No, well, it is incredibly positive. I mean, okay, the, the energy itself is is kind of neutral, but if you're negative on it, it tends to enhance the negativity. But the, but the 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 really interesting thing here is the um, these these cosmic energies come and go over a long period of time they're linked to these waves of energy that come out from space through these active galactic nuclei working a bit like capacitors they take this energy in and, and then they move it straight out and these regular waves of cosmic energy go and come over time and there's a good chance that these are linked now to our change in consciousness over thousands of years so the last time we were in group consciousness, we were immersed in a high cosmic energy environment. We then had no concentrations of energy coming through, or very little, and now we're coming back to the next cycle of, of cosmic energy coming in from these active centers, and we're now moving to a higher cosmic energy. And you can look, look at the, the amounts of cosmic energy we're getting now, that, that we're off the scale when it comes to, to the amounts of energy we're getting in. And now there, there's a normal up increase and decrease in cosmic energy with the which links to the sun cycles. And we're going into sort of grand solar minimum, which is going to increase cosmic energy even more. But because we've now got this extra cosmic energy, because we're exiting the local interstellar cloud, we're getting the north and magnetic fields, of the earth are changing, they're moving towards each other almost. So there's, there's, there's all the signs showing we're getting a lot more cosmic energy coming through. And that's evolutionary. So Corey, this is absolutely fascinating, fascinating.
Well, I'm mind I'm, blowing, I'm really. <laughs> so we, I'm going to listen to this map- interview about three times, by the way. <laughs> we, we ended up mapping where all these new emperor dragons were. And, uh, That's what I'd love to segue into. I'm fasc- I mean, it's a very yeah, popular it topic, but the, the, the dragon lines. Yeah. Um, and you define the lines by the, they're defined by the, the, obviously the sound, but the width of the lines as well. The width tends to be much wider for these, mm. for these lines. Um, but, but having said that, I, I have a friend who does is all the lines twice the width of li- as I do. So there's an individual consciousness that's important. Mm. And, 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 and this is also, you, you can have the most powerful sacred place in the world, but if no one's there, if no con- human consciousness is connected to it, there's nothing. It's like sacredness is a, is, a, is, a, is a connection between the place and the human connection. So it, 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 it grows, sacredness grows as more people come together on, on a particular site. Or it moves, yeah. as you mentioned earlier. Tends to be, you can anchor them and fix them. What, what happens when they move, and one of the things that the in, in pyramids in, in, in Mexico, places like Chichen Itza, the incoming uh, uh, conquering nations, if you like, would want to depower the old religions. And they knew about these energies and they would, they would create human sacrifices on top of these, uh, these pyramids to, to create horrible emotions. And, and lines move away from places that they don't like. And they gravitate towards places like children's playgrounds and, 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 uh, and, and hospices where they feel they can be most used. So because they're, they're, there's a, they're, they're connected to consciousness, the universal consciousness, so, and, and as well as our consciousness. So they have an ability to move, and we also have an ability to move them and anchor them and keep them in a particular place when, when you've built up the knowledge and, and experience on how to do that. So um, what, what became important was to find out, finding where these, these lines were. And, the dragon and lines? Is, the, dra- the dragon lines, and this, this has been one of the most amazing journeys for, for two, for two three, three, first of all, you can learn to map these remotely. If you've done enough work in the field, you can do this remotely. So you, you, you almost have, have like a grid on a map? You start with a map and a grid and you, and you do it on a large scale. And you may find on a large scale, you've got one line coming in here, one line coming here. For instance, there's a place in Morocco in the Atlas Mountains, and I knew where these two lines were coming in. But I was on a very high level scale. So I, 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 I mean, the, you couldn't even see the name of the towns on the map. And all I could see is they were coming into this middle part. Of the, 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 and so I, I got smaller and smaller in scale. And it takes a while. Can and I, I just ask, things. did you use your dowsing rods or a pendulum or no, how did you? For that, for that, I was using the dowsing rods. I, I map it out on the ground and I walk across like I'm there. Oh, and okay. I so map you, the map was small. really blown up. It's not like a little yeah, A4. Yeah. yeah. So no, no. The, 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 you, so I can walk across a ground area about you know five square meters, right. and you put you put markers for where there are markers on on the map. But what was happening is that you could see this this cross was crossing over in, in the mountains somewhere, and you, I had no idea where it was. And eventually, when you get to a small enough scale, you can see this tiny little oasis. All right, in the middle of the Moroccan mountains. And yeah. sure enough, as you zoom in further and further and further, you see not just this oasis, but overlooking this oasis, there is the outline of an old fort. And you can tell that it's a sort of a European medieval, almost a Templar fort, in the middle of the Moroccan mountains. And the node is just there, right next to a, 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 a little mosque dome. Now, you have no idea that's going to be the case when you start mapping. How that, wonderful. You get that wonderful feedback saying, well, my goodness, this is why. You, you, couldn't, you couldn't pick anywhere on the map and try and zoom in and get that. You're led to finding these things. And, you, and I, I would come across places that I was mapping these lines. And, and I would, for instance, there's a place in Africa called Muxima in, in Angola. And I, I mean, I never know about this place, but there the lines crossing over and, and zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, and there's a tiny little church near this place called Maxima. And I thought, well, that's got to be a special church. I started looking it up. This is a site of pilgrimage for Africans all over the place. They come there every year. So there's just this one place. And you think, how on earth does that happen? 
and yeah, the so, lines are yeah. suddenly. It's place. it's fascinating. So it's 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 a balance of where the lines meet, but also the yeah. the emotions and love of the people in in, in a positive sense. And you can, can go back in the past. Of, you, you come across the Chinese pyramids. Do you know about Chinese pyramids? Uh, very little. Uh, well, I, I'd heard about one or two Chinese pyramids before. They, they were all kind of like really mythical. And it wasn't until I was plotting the lines from this, one of the most sacred places in the world called Mount Kailash, running across China. And it, it was near to a place called Xiang, uh, Xiangyang. I, I probably got the translation wrong. But I could see it was heading to where I knew there was this pyramid. It's called the White Pyramid. And when I started looking on Google Earth and zooming in, which is amazing. Isn't tool, Google Earth amazing? Yeah. And, and there are over 120 pyramids. Wow. These are wider at the base than the pyramids at Giza. They're not as high and they're flat topped, but they're following a complete line across the area for over 100 kilometers. What is going on with the pyramid? And the line, the emperor dragon is running through all of those pyramids in that That's same Amazing. Line. I mean, and, how and is it possible? I mean, it is. You, but... you, well, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have believed it. And yet you, you, you're just finding that you're following an invisible line on the map and you're just introduced to these incredible places. And, um, and then when I was doing the last dragon that came, which, which came in, in July last year, returned and came across America. And um, I, I've mapped this line coming in uh, in California, very close to Big Sur. And this connected up with uh, uh, something else, which is quite, quite mad synchronicity that I, I, I met this wonderful chap called David Alexander English on the top of Silbury Hill in Wiltshire in the middle of a thunderstorm on a Monday afternoon. And it just happened to be the equinox. The As time. you do. This was back in 1999, and, and, and you know, I was in a suit. You probably thought I was someone from you know, Men in Black or something. <laughs> but I just thought I'd stop by the first time and, and have, a, have a look up there. And um, anyway, we kind of got chatting, and he was telling me about the Hopis and, and their, their, their movements around the world and what they were trying to do. And, and, and a years before, and I didn't really take too much understanding, is he'd found an observatory, an old Indian observatory on the edge of, of the coast, not far from Big Sur. And the node that had, that had come in from the Pacific of this new dragon ran straight through this observatory. And that, that we call it Jade Node now. And um, he's, he, he's been on an amazing journey just recently, at the, a recent harmony time. He's been to the nodes in California that connect to these emperor dragons. Um, He's, he's seeing it from a, a, an angle of the, the Indian thousands of years ago were completely aware of the last time the Emperor Dragons were around. So we, 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 what, was, what for me was an amazing journey by plotting these lines across America and how they connected to the existing lines, I would get people contacting me saying, you need to check out this site. And, and, and I'm thinking, that's exactly where these lines are heading. You know? Amazing. So they were telling me about places and I was, I was about to reach them as the lions were connecting up. Now there's a lovely lady uh, who, who contacted me just before I just, and she said, you've got to go and look at this place called Holy Hill in Wisconsin. I live nearby and, I'm, I'm, and she said, she's, I think she's a nun and, and she, 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 she's very spiritual and she found herself drawn to this place called Holy Hill and she lit up to move hundreds of miles to get to this place. And I was in the middle of mapping these two lines going straight towards this area. And then she tells me suddenly it's Holy Hill. And I'm looking at this huge basilica to the Virgin Mary on top of this Glastonbury-like hill sticking out of the, of the woodlands around it. And you can just sense the energies there. And this is where there was an, another major intersection. And, and, and since then, she then now meditates uh, on the node there. And, and, and this last harmony time, just they start just before the solstices and the equinoxes. We had, we had groups, nine or 10 groups on the nodes in, in California. We had, we had people in Pennsylvania, Michigan, uh, Wisconsin, Florida, New Jersey, uh, New York, Kentucky, Tennessee, 
a Texas. They're, they're beginning to gravitate on, on these major nodes. But the two major emperor dragons that cross America, they come in in California around Big Sur and Monterey, and they go all the way across to, to Norfolk in Virginia. And they go through some amazing sites like um, um, some of the, the Native American Indian sacred sites like Navajo Mountain mm -hmm. and uh, Blanca Peak, very, very powerful places. But these two lines, what David calls it, is a sacred corridor. And you can see people making pilgrimages like they did in the old days back to the sacred corridor. Uh, actually, he's just written a book called The Natural History of Life and Death. David is Alexander English, and he's, he's the first one who's got the, the maps of the lines of the dragon. I'll put that in the show notes for people as well as all your details. So get, get that book. There's some maps of where the global emperor dragons are in that. Uh, so the, the, the dragon lines, um, I'd love to know where they are, but also you mentioned they got, they're in pairs. Yeah, this is the interesting thing about uh, why would a line be in a pair? And, mm. and that's where the standing waves come in. They, 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 they sort of emanate outwards and then they sort of come back. So you've got an outward pulse and an inward pulse, and, and that, that's why we find them in pairs. Um, I should just mention briefly, I'm talking about one sector of Earth energy lines, this, which are the sound and vibration type. There's another type of Earth energy line, which is very much surface-based. And these are caused, and, and their, their source is mainly electromagnetic, and these are caused by Earth's magnetic field interacting with the sun's magnetic field. They create things called Birkin currents. Birkin currents are thought to go into the Earth and cause ground induction currents. And from uh, mapping these, we see what we, we, we what Dow's has called them telluric currents, and they form grids which are like nets, if you like, and, and there are names like the Hartman Curry grids, the Benka grids. They're, they're a different type of energy line, but they have an importance, but they're, they're more surface based compared to the ones coming from the, the interior. So, sorry, what, you, what your question again was? On where, the, are the, where are the dragon lines located around the world? Well, maybe I should start off with explaining where, where, where some are down in, in Australia. Would that be? Yes, sure. Well, this this starts off back in 2012 we had to map the first where the first three lines were um one of them ran through from a place called seal rocks on on the east coast of just, just north of sydney all the way across uh, australia to the dampier peninsula on the other side on the, on the sort of northwest coast where there's some wonderful uh, rock art there and you see there's obviously places but it runs right through Uluru. Okay, this, this uh, Ember, Ember Dragon, and there was only one of them. The other pair ran a bit slightly to the north. And I mapped Uluru with all the other major lines, the type four lines. And, and about five years later, uh, I saw someone else had mapped it and, and, and it produced a map inside a magazine. And it was exactly the same as the one I'd mapped remotely, and he'd been there. So I was, it was good confirmation that the lines mm -hmm. were right. But when this uh, last Emperor Dragon came, it not only runs through uh, America, but it heads down through one of the small Hawaiian islands, all the way down, and it comes in at the northwest side of Australia. And it, and, and it, it came about 20 kilometers to the north of the route, <clears throat> both pairs, and exits just south of, of, of uh, uh, um, Darwin on, on, on the southeast coast. Now, one of the, one of the areas of work that we do, what we realize is that the, to, for a node to be fully functional, you need all the lines coming together in a point, and they need to have all the pairs there, and it needs to be symmetrical. And you need a symmetrical point because when, when you have symmetry, you get this cylinder of energy around the node. And when you have a cylinder of energy around the node, in, inside the lines, there are lots of little different flow directions. And when flow directions are neutral, they cause little vortexes. But when you have a containment field and lots of little vortexes, just like in water, and you find water uh, vortexes, mm -hmm. if you have a containment field, the small vortexes can build and grow into a bigger and bigger, larger vortex. And this is what happens at these harmony times. These, all these vortexes form. And when they're strong enough, it collapses the cylinder of energy into this double torus with a vortex in the middle. This is what we call the grail energy shape. Because it's, once you get this double torus with a vortex in, it seems to op open up a gate or a portal 
that allows for communication to these other worlds and to the people who live on them. And that only happens on certain occasions. But it's it very interesting happen. you say that because I don't know if you know PMH Atwater, who's been on the show and talks about near death experiences. And in one of her books, she talks about the Taurus that is, she had three near death experiences, but she saw the Taurus and she thought that was the gateway to the other worlds in her near death experience. Well, uh, I'm absolutely sure of it. And we have a Taurus energy around us. And one of the things we have to do when there's a Taurus energy at a node is we have to resonate at the same frequency. And we do that through sound. And we try and make sounds which are the higher harmonics of the fundamental frequencies. Oh, so but that's yeah, how you heal them or fix them or repair them? Uh, the, the, heal, yeah, the healing and the resonance is certainly, it's like re, it's like re, if you think about Let's take a tumor, for instance. The tumor is, is not solid either. It's just created by energy. And for, when healers eliminate tumors, they go to the subquantum level and they select, reprogram the subroutines, if you like, so that it doesn't produce uh, a malignancy. It just it produces the, the original sort of uh, uh, example of what was there before. And, and I've, I've, I've been really blessed to meet some amazing people in my life. And there was one lady who taught me how she heals. She, she, she was flown to Denki University, lady called Carol Everett, Denki University in Japan, where she was wired up to an EEG machine and she was tested by a chap called Professor Yoshi Machi. And the lady had been diagnosed with having a tumor in her ovary that, that morning and she's in front of the thermal imagery scanner and, and, and Carol had been flown 3000 miles just to test her ability to medically understand what was wrong with her. So that was a test just mm -hmm. to find out whether she could diagnose her if this lady is having a tumor in the ovary. And, and Carol said almost within the first few seconds, oh, you've got a tumor in your ovary. And the professor said, oh, we've flown you all this time. We've hardly got any information on you on your EEG machines, machines at all. And Carol said, no, I can get rid of it. And you can see in seven minutes, and they've got Fuji TV, live TV on, on cameras, on Carol, on this woman. And there's a, there's a thermal imagery scan on the room next door. In those seven minutes, you can see that the, the reddish area, which was a heated tumor, go back to a normal blue background color. And the tumor was gone in under seven minutes. This is live TV. And you can see that her mind is completely nothing going on in the left brain. It's all right brain activity. And, and she's, she, the way she does it, and she connects with these universal energies. In fact, she, she's now, her clinic is now on one of these emperor dragons in Spain. So she, she's getting really powerful yeah. healing now. She, and she does, she's doing some amazing things. But it's about getting to the, the subroutines sub and connecting with universal consciousness that creates the energy in the first place and rewiring it so that it, it creates new energy again. And when you're at these portals, of course, you, you, you have the access to that. So the intent that you use in those places is so much more effective. I mean, there's an old saying, be careful what you wish for, because at those places, it happens. And then one of the, one of the, going back to one of the, the passions I have now in life about the importance of, of following vocations, we, we don't know what we need to do yet in, what, in regards to what's coming. We need more people to gather in group meditations at these places to be themselves, to learn their own individual cards in life. Because only through loads of different individual people following their own individual paths, but connected on, on a vocation, which is like part being part of the grand design, you will find and learn what everybody needs to learn and know. So you, you will contribute to the whole, if you like. And, and one of the ways to do that and follow your vocational path, which Jung calls individuation, is through synchronicity. So we, we now ask for synchronicity on these nodes to help show us our individual ways to what, what we should be doing in life. And when we start following the synchronicity, and, and I've seen just amazing things start happening for people who've done that. And we, we've had examples of synchronicity within minutes after having meditated on a node, uh, which, is, which is just phenomenal. And, and people's lives have been changed. And so I just wish that everyone could discover synchronicity and to follow it and explore it to, to, to find out what you should be doing and to travel to one of these sacred sites well you don't need to be on the really powerful these lines are okay. everywhere everywhere which, which which we did touch on yeah yeah there's so many i mean it's, it's great to go to these sacred sites which are which are wonderful and we, and we i mean I, I i mean we travel maybe an hour maximum to get to a site like glastonbury or oliver's castle or something like that in the uk but but you don't need to be that close 
And like that, once you've been on a sacred site, you carry those frequencies with you. And, and that, that, that goes off another story. But, but uh, coming back to the, the cosmic energies and, and the emperor dragons, oh yeah, the, 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 um, the ones in, in, in Australia, they, they, they were on a sort of tic-tac-toe path. They weren't crossing over in one place. Mm -hmm. So they, they needed they, some repair work on them. They needed some repair works, yes. And you uh, mentioned and you, you, sorry, you do that with, with sound, the repairing. The, 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 there are several ways you can repair these lines, which I won't go into, mm -hmm. but I was told I couldn't do this one in the room. But you, one person can't move, and it, I mean, we can move any normal energy lines, but the, the emperor dragons don't quite behave the same way. You need a, you need a group of people to move a line for that big. And you've all got to be in accordance with what's going on. So I knew that a group of people had to work on a room to, to repair, the, to bring in the new emperor, the returning emperor, back to the existing site. And Fascinating. And that could have been done remotely, not on location. No, I was told it couldn't be done remotely. It had to be done by the locals. Uh, okay. So, and, and, and there's another major site in the world. The last one that's got to be done has got to be done in Peru. And I know the locals have got to do that from there. But I, I can't do it. Like, but I, I managed to get the information to certain people over there in Peru. So you kind of once you get the information to the right people, you have to let them do it in their own time. And and uh, I was kind of wondering how this was going to happen in, in Uluru. And uh, we did a meditation last September on Glastonbury Tour. We had about forty people around the top. And. This is at the harmony time, the Taurus is spinning the vortex with them. And, and, and we just finished. And this lovely gentleman, his partner came along, giant of a man, six foot eight, six foot nine, <laughs> with this huge didgeridoo. And um, a, 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 a Aboriginal gentleman and um, played the, the didg on the tour in, in the old ruined church up there, the most incredible sense. And we, we talked afterwards, and I realized that he had some, some serious connections with the wisdom keepers. He said he trained with them. And uh, so I was able to send him some, some, uh, some maps and said, look, you need to get this to the right people. They need to do some work here. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't know what happened after that, but I'll tell you what I do know. <laughs> Two weeks later, they closed the room. Right. Do you know that? Do you, yes, you can't, you can't climb it. You can't get up there. Yeah. And in January this year, they had a big ceremony. And when I, I checked last did. remotely in February, it seems like it was repaired. So someone did something. Fantastic. <laughs> so that, that was nice. So, and we just got Peru to do, and then that's, that's building the net up again into its strength. And we need the, the net to be fully repaired, and we need to get the local people to these nodes. So, so my role at the moment is to... And it, mapping does take a while, which is, which is, um, a bit, but it's to then get that information to people local on the ground. And the most amazing thing is they seem to pop up at the right time. Synchronicity. So I have to find them. Yeah, no, they, 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 it's like, you know, I'm working on the lines, they sort of live on the lines or nearby, and, and yeah, they're just nearby. And so it, it's, it's emerging organically in a wonderful way. And How of course, wonderful. the more people who are meditating, the more effect it has on the environment. It's sending out these positive waves of energy to, to, to make the change we need. How it's, fascinating. It's, you, you mentioned also before about f you could feel the energy. So can you feel the energy in different, pla different locations? Well, I can tell you what. <laughs> it's easy to feel the bad ones. I'll explain what I mean by that. There are, if you, if you imagine the earth is, is pumping out all these different frequencies and life on earth is just buzzing it's been going for mm -hmm. percent, millennia but as the odds would have it there's going to be one or two frequencies that are not great for cells and cell frequencies there's a kind of discordance so if you've got a cell in your body that's getting the right sound it'll resonate and flourish but if you've got a frequency which you which for instance imagine listening to a jackhammer drill yeah. constantly outside your bedroom you can you're hearing it 24-7. It, it it'll make you go mad. But even if it's outside of your hearing range and it's still going on, it will still have an effect on you. 
and, and what we're finding is if you're living in one place for a long period of time or working in one place, and that's the same place as a line which has a frequency which is not conducive towards cells, it, it sets up stress, internal cellular stress, and this leads to things like cancers and diseases and chronic, chronic problems. And we know oncologists in Germany have told some of their patients just to not go home because they know certain locations are where people get cancer. In Germany. There are, there are particular lines called what we call moon phase lines that are affected by the position of the moon. If you've got a moon phase line running through where you live and you're there for too long, you're, you're going you're gonna to actually potentially suffer from this, whether you know it's there or not. It, it's, it, it's, a, it's a bit like when you bend a, a, a bit of metal. If you bend a bit of metal, you can release it and it goes back to its normal state. Mm -hmm. If you just keep it bent for about you know, five days, the time duration will stop it going back to normal. So time is a big factor in stress. Now, if you go to these moon phase lines, and I teach dowsing and I teach people how to recognize them, and what we do is we take our protection away from us when we stand on these lines to begin to feel where the frequency affects us in our body. And you, some people feel it up, up here, I feel it on my chest just here, some people feel it in their feet. And, and, and so they will experience the feeling of these lines in their bodies and, and where it feels bad. Now, I taught a, I had a group of people come over from America, from all around America, they were a group of, on a shamanic practitioner uh, a tour where they were learning to be practitioners. Sh shaman they were all wonderful people. They didn't need dowsing rods after a few minutes. They could feel it. So I was taken to these different types of energy lines and they could feel the differences of these energy lines in different parts of their body with different feelings. And that, that, that sensitivity to that was wonderful to see. And I mean, I'm, I'm not as sensitive as that. And, and perhaps I'm not sure I want to be, to be honest, because you're going to be affected <laughs> so much more by these things. But the answer to your question is yes, we can feel these things, but we just take our guard down and allow a, a, a sense of heightened awareness, if you like, to be able to feel that resonance. And it is a resonance. It's our vibrations resonating or not resonating with the, the, the vibrations coming from the center of the earth. Very, very interesting. And the moon phase lines you talk about, if someone's living on them, can they be uh, repaired or changed yeah, to a more can. positive line? Yeah, well, they're, they're a, bit, a bit plucky little things because they like moving back. So you have to move them a little bit and anchor them. And you can do that in a variety of ways. Best you actually with, move off them. Yeah, you can move the lines away from them. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, best you actually move location. That's probably the easiest option. Uh, well, sometimes you can just move your bedroom to a different part of the house okay. or move, move a chair. You know, that, that's one option. There are issues of moving lines in, 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 a, in a crowded environment because if you move it out of your house, it could be moving into someone else's. Mm. See? So you can't really do that. In fact, when you, when you do this work, you sh I, I, I can't decide. In fact, you, the rather strange thing about dowsing and looking for energy lines and doing energy works is I have to have this I don't care attitude. I don't care where the lines want to go or what they want to do. It's not up to me. So I'm completely separated from the outcome. If I'm not separated from the outcome, then I will influence it. And I don't want to be an influence to that because I need to, have, I need to be connected to the highest source, if you like, to be able to... Mm -hmm to get them that to make the decision and not me. Yeah, not the mind or the person or the personality that is Rory Duff. Well, it's just so easy. It, it, look, I mean, I, I, I've studied hypnosis and, and things like that. It's so easy to suggest. In fact, one of the wonderful things about dowsing is when you kind of expect to find something and you don't, because then you know you're not making it up even more. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, no response is always good. Very interesting. I know you had your books on the table before. Do you want to um, hold those well, up? Yeah, this is... And congratulations again on the books. Thank you. This is Grail. We better touch on that because we've covered a lot of topics. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, this was literally, I, I didn't, I no, no, no thought of the, the connection with the Grail at all. Um, we, we, we just discovered these emperor dragons and we found them down in Spain. And they were, they were again crossing in a tic-tac-toe and they needed to be repaired. And I was told I couldn't repair them and, um, on my own, but I had to repair them soon. And this was, so I had to, I had to 
find the right people, even know the right people. So I did a talk in Bastonbury at, at, at a positive living group there, and about 70 people turned up, which is nice. But I said to them in the talk, I need help to repair a major intersection. I can't tell you where it is, because of, so anyway. At the end of the talk, this, this first person came up and to me and says, I think I should be working with you. He says, for some reason, I, I, I feel I'm an anchor, but I don't know what that means. I knew exactly what it meant. And that Tim joined us. And then um, David, who'd been having dreams of dragons all week, popped up and said, I feel the place is in Spain, but, and, and I'm sure I'm supposed to be working with you. So David was there, he's an amazing chairman, as well as being one of the most amazing statisticians in the world, <laughs> strangely enough, yeah. a great combination. And then uh, Michael turned up and said, uh, I, I, I think I should be working with you and I know the people who can fund it, which is even better. How two wonderful. Weeks later, three weeks later, we were on the plane. And that week we had in Spain was just so surreal. We didn't know what we were doing from one morning to the next. It was just, we were totally guided. And at the end, with the last move coming up, we were like, just realized at that stage, we were token representatives of planet Earth. That was so much going on. That's that so not, beautiful. So you, just, we just, generally you need a, a team of people to heal a line like that or appear. Yeah, but you can't, you can't set about, in this game, you can't set about building this thing on your own. That's the weird thing about it. Mm -hmm. Synchronicity is about connecting to the timing of the universe and just, just being in the flow and, and, and expect, expecting and knowing that people will turn up at the right place at the right time. And they do. It, it's, 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 it continues to shock me. I mean, I, I had so much recently in, in, in connection with Jung and, and discovering Jung's Red Book and his, his, his images in his Red Book. And I, when I when I found the images in his red book, I'm just thinking, oh my goodness, there's so much a connection to these energy lines and dows in here. And, 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 and these, even the Taurus shapes and the vortex shapes, and, and the, the, all the snakes and dragons and images, and he's being told something here. So I spent hundreds of hours reading his red book or researching it. I'm just finishing the book. Okay, I'm in the middle of a, of a field next to a river in England. And it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wild swimming river. And I'm just sitting in a deck chair in the sun. And these two people walk past, old, 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 old couple, and they see me reading this, this book. And the lady comes up to me and says, are you reading the red book? And I said, yes. She said, my husband and I are Jungian analysts. Oh, and wow. <laughs> this is in the middle of nowhere. So that then led to a conversation about things. And that was great because that was the next bit of synchronicity leading on to the next. And that introduced me to a wonderful book and an author by, by Peter Kingsley. Or Kettle Falker, but the whole picture begins to build, and, and, and then you begin to realize this whole young concept of individuation, where you're going on this journey to find out how you can grow and develop and be, become, in a way, contributing to society in a way that you're supposed to. And then you realize that what we're faced with is this, and I haven't talked about this universal prophecy where the world is going to go through some amazing changes, and we need to prepare for this. And, and one of the things we haven't worked out yet is what we need to be doing in group meditation. So we know that group meditation is different from individual meditation, but each one of us has a role to play, but we don't know all the roles. Mm -hmm. and, and but one of the amazing things is found that when we, we have these gatherings at these sites and we never organize who's gonna turn up. It, the people will turn up if and, if and when they want to. And the number of times we've had exactly the same number of men and women, like six men and six women, or 12 men, 12 women. And it would be like people we've never seen before, people just come along, and, and there would be the perfect combination that would work for things to happen at that point. And, we, and, and we're still searching about why those 12 are the right people. And one of the things we've discovered is when you find a center of a line, the very center of an energy line. Each person finds it slightly different from where everybody else does. And when, when you have a group of six people who find the centers of the line, who are all different people, each of those centers where they find an intersection, and we do this and we look up and we're all in a perfect circle. 
each of us planning the center of the two intersections. And, and you can do that in another node in, in several kilometers away, and we did this in April, and the same exercise, we each finding the two centers, and we look up, this is what we discovered, we looked up and we were all in exactly the same positions. It was though we individually each have a role to play. Mm. And at the stage right now, we don't know what that role is, and we need to discover it. So we need more people meditating to find out what their role and purpose is in life. And that's, that's the exciting journey. But what we'll get to in the end is that we'll get enough people meditating on these nodes at these, at these amazing times. And that will lift the consciousness seriously on this planet by a long, long way. Uh, all, what Rupert Sheldrake calls morphic resonance. We'll reach a critical threshold when uh, there's a sort of entrainment of learning throughout all minds. And then there's some lovely experiments that they've done or they've seen, or observations where group learning occurs when a certain threshold is reached have you come across those i have i have i mean yes so, and, and i'm a major fan of meditation as well uh, well and we've got so much to, to learn still on that but we're getting there um but uh when that if we can reach that critical threshold we will we will move and transcend beyond what we're going through in this world right now which is I think is stemming because of this huge cosmic energy we're coming in, it's destabilizing the thing. And energy lines themselves accentuate emotions. If you're feeling positive, you'll be very, very positive. If you're feeling negative, you'll be very, very negative. So one of the, the cases is that because we've got that, all this extra cosmic energy coming in, it's causing mental disturbances in so many people around the world and they're not quite sure why they're thinking the way they are, but it's polarizing thoughts. But we need to learn to, to, to to move away from that and i can't see any other future apart from us coming together in group meditation and and learning to, to connect and be guided and then we'll be fine mm. so uh yeah coming back to the the, the great beautiful now. you asked me to, meant to tell you to remind you to mention the sacred corridor i don't know if you <laughs> wanted the, 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 the sacred corridors are, the, are, are in between the two dragons the emperor dragons. Okay. So the sacred corridor across the states uh, all the way through that that was it but Interesting. The, the, yeah just the last bit on the templar grail and how that connected up was well, once we found and repaired the node in spain we followed the lines up through spain and through france and one pair and, and the first place we came to was a, a, a little a town called calabaca de la cruz now most people haven't heard of calabaca de la cruz but it, in, mm -hmm. in the mafia region it's a central place for pilgrimage. It's a place where miracles used to happen. It's also a very powerful node. And in the chapel at the top, there is this window, which has been boarded up and around it are these symbols. I can probably just show you this yeah. on, 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 the, on the camera there. You can just about see the, the symbols. No one's ever deciphered those before. And, and yet there were some ideas there that, that came to me. But it wasn't until we got further into France and I, I came across this place called Monson Chapel. And inside this chapel, again, another really powerful note, there are just Templar symbols on the ceiling all over the place. And the Templar ceiling symbols were just like the grail shapes. And you can see the changing shape of the grail on the ceiling. So it's like they knew these energy shapes. And I think that uh, there was a small group of Templar knights and Templars who, who were looking to find the most sacred place in Europe, which was down in, in Spain. And they got very close, but they didn't find it because the node at the time was broken. Oh. It hadn't been repaired. So they never found it. So that, 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 the book was about the story of, of, of the Templar Grail and it connects up. Well, everyone needs to read the book because it's, it's fascinating. If, if you're not into science, I'll point this one out, by the way. Mm -hmm. The Grail Hunter. This is a novel. It's a nice, easy way. It follows a young lady's uh, journey into, into the discovery of, of, of this grail. It's an easy segue uh, into... It is, and it's a lovely journey through understanding synchronicity and how she finds her vocation in life. So that and I do, to write. I do, congratulations. I do know you have some other books as well on the ley lines and... Yeah, so this is the one on... Grail Band is the one on the Universal Prophecies, which is... What, what, what seems to be the case is that there's been people who've been getting information, like that just there, mm -hmm. on 
All around the world, Quero Indians, the Hopi Indians, the Meritrea Indian prophecy, even Medjugorje and, and Fatima, they're all connected to this coming event. Peter Dionov, the Bulgarian uh, uh, mystic, um, even ones that prophecy rock, black health vision, great vision, they're all linked to saying the same thing about something that's coming, which we think is going to happen in 2024, 2024, 2025, which is when a wave of energy is going to hit us. The cosmic, the full force of cosmic energy. Interesting. Very interesting. I did mention I talk rather a lot, so I apologize. No, no, no. I, lo I love you talking. I, I guess in the interest of time, is there anything else you'd particularly like to express to the audience? No, no um, just become interested in finding your vocation. Look for synchronicity. Get on these sacred sites and you can find them there everywhere. Uh, I mean, in, in Australia, there's dream time sites. Every dream time site where the song lines intersect, they're the same. Song lines are the same as these sound lines. Mm. These Aborigines knew what they were talking about. Yeah. The dream time sites, these are the notes. So that's why they're so sacred. But they're everywhere. And um, it's exciting because you, you start connecting with these energies. Energies in, in the gospel, Gnostic Gospels, you find that they, they talk about the Garden of Eden in a slightly different way. The snake in the Garden of Eden was told, talked of as the instructor, the teacher. And the snakes are symbolic in all countries, in all cultures, for earth energy lines. So the earth energy lines are our teacher, because it's the direct connection to universal consciousness. What an what a incredible, unbelievable wealth of information. Thank you so much, Rory Duff, for being on Passion Harvest. Uh, it's really, really been an honour for me. So uh, thank you very, very much. And thank you for all the wonderful work that you're doing for our world and our consciousness. Well, it's not just me. It's all everyone else. I'm it's not just you, but you're yet. playing a very big part. So I just wanted to well, say thank you. That's very kind. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much for giving me the time to, to talk. Yes. Th Thanks, Rory. Thanks for going on for so long. Sorry. No, I loved it. I loved it. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye. If you like this episode, please do subscribe for weekly passionate inspirational interviews.